On behalf of Alexander School, I would like to welcome everyone attending this lecture. For those of you who are not familiar with Alexander School, we are a Coptic Orthodox educational research and publisher. The school is located in Heliopolis in Cairo. The school started in 2015. Our publications include 110 Christian academic and spiritual books, which cover various subjects and topics. We also publish the Alexander School Journal, which currently has 29 editions, including more than 400 academic articles. We also offer diverse courses and lectures in the school itself and also online. Currently, we have two of our courses are uploaded on Udemy. Uh, you can find the links in the chat below if you would like to attend. Also in the chat, where you, you can find the links to our YouTube, Telegram, SoundCloud, and Facebook pages. Uh, as well as the school's website, where you can also uh, download uh, and, and buy many of our eBooks on the website. Many researchers from across the uh, from across the world publish their work through our school. Uh, currently, we're working on um, a lot of different pro projects, such as the first full Arabic translation of the Septuagint from the original Greek. So currently, we have published we've published the Torah and the historical books. Also, uh, we're working on producing commentaries on uh, Paul's epistles. Right now, we have uh, Philemon and Colossians have been published. Also working, uh, right now, we're also working on, the trans on translating uh, Philo, the Jewish philosopher's works, into Arabic. Uh, moreover, we published uh, a volume set of three Coptic dialect dialects, Bahari, Saidi, uh, Saidi, and Fayumi. Um, we also produce a textbook to teach Hebrew. And uh, on YouTube, you're going to find uh, a video series to accompany most of the book. We welcome any type of cooperation with researchers to publish their works and translations um, from anywhere around the world. And on that note, I would, uh, would honor me to welcome Dr. Mirto Theokaros. Um, Dr. Mirto is the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament at the Greek Bible College in Athens, Greece. She has received her, her master's in biblical exegesis from Wheaton College uh, and her doctorate in Hebrew studies from the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Dr. Mirto. Um, it's lovely to have you here and we can't wait to, to hear your lecture. Thank you very much for the invitation, Karim, and uh, for everything you've said about the School of Alexandria. It's great to know the projects that are happening now. Uh, so our topic today is the status of women in the Old Testament. And I will be sharing a, my screen with you. I hope it works. So the approach I am taking today is not the historical critical approach. I'm not looking at different sources and uh, examining this chronologically, but I am looking at the text as it stands, as it is in our Bibles, as we call it the Old Testament, and it's, um, it's the book of the church. So I will not be getting into historical critical analysis. Um, my uh, project today will be to start from the very beginning, from um, the book of Genesis. Uh, so uh, let me um, see if I can get this right. Uh, the woman in creation. So how is the woman presented in the beginning? This is uh, the first thing we must look at. The beginnings of God, of God's creation usually tell us or are expected to show us the intentions of God for humanity. So first of all, I would like us to look at this aspect of the image of God together for the woman, especially but for humanity in general, but especially for the woman. So God's intentions for the creation of humans are found in the first chapter of Genesis and particularly in verse 26, where God declares, uh, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
So we are so used to this expression that humans are made according to the image of God, that it does not really make an impression to us anymore. But in the ancient world, this expression must have appeared extremely strange uh, because only kings were characterized as God's image in both Egypt and Mesopotamia. In Egypt, the king is usually called the image of God, of God Re or Amon Re or Horus or Atom or Ammon. And for example, we have the god Amon Re who speaks about his king, Amenhotep III, and he says the following You are my beloved son, the one who came out of my loins, my image, which I have placed on earth. I appointed that you will rule the land with peace. So in the creation story now, the writer being familiar with this ancient understanding about the king as the image of God, he uses that same expression provocatively to apply it to humanity as a whole. What we have here then is a radical democratization of the expression image of God. Even more radical or shocking, if you will, is the fact that this expression is not used only for the male, but also for the female. Apparently, it is not enough for the writer that the exclusivity of this term for the king is abolished and is now applied to every man, but beyond this, it even passes to every woman. And we can also see this in Genesis 5. This is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humankind, Adam, he made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them Adam, humankind, when they were created. So if the female is just as adequate to represent God, then this may indicate that God does not have a male gender, or, that, or rather, it may be an indication that God is gender full, full gendered. So sure, God is described as Elohim in Hebrew, and Elohim has a masculine ending, and the verbs used for Elohim are also masculine, but this is the only available word for God's. And it is used for both male and female gods in ancient Palestine. So God appears with both feminine and masculine metaphors. As a father, he appears in the scriptures. And as a mother, he appears in the scriptures. So therefore, the word Elohim, as well as the verbs and metaphors used, are not indicative of God's gender. It is God's image that takes us closer to who God is. And this is precisely the reason that he forbids humans from representing him with any image, since he has chosen himself to be represented by both male and female. One could be tempted to sculpt a man in order to depict God or even a woman. One could be tempted to imagine a wife for God, another goddess on the basis of one's assumption that God is male. And it is therefore through divine marriage that he would give birth to humanity. In fact, archeological discoveries in Israel have shown that Israelites did depict God, not only as the golden calf of which we all know, but also as a man. And they indeed created a wife for him, his Asherah. So you can see some of the, um, uh, pictures here that have been discovered of uh, Yahweh and his Asherah. So giving a gender to God would have opened the way to thinking of God as a sexual being that could be potentially sexually manipulated uh, through a fertility cult, which was the most common type of cult in the ancient world. But the question arises, is the female and male image of God on the same level? Are they equal? And an answer might shed light on whether God viewed the woman as equal to man when he was creating. So one aspect to consider is the aspect of authority, because from the first chapter, we see the woman standing side by side with her man with an equal identity, 
not only in being called God's image along with the man, but it is also shown in their call or commission found in the same verse we have seen before. It says in Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So here, for the first time in the Bible, we encounter the issue of human authority, of rulership, and the intentions of God for both the man and the woman to rule together. The Hebrew verb is in the plural, to rule over creation together. So the, there is no intention from God for one human being to rule over another human being here. On the contrary, the mission of humans for authority over the creator's creation is exactly the same for both the man and the woman. And of course, things will change later. And in 316, after the first sin is committed, we will see a human ruling over another human. We will see man having authority over a woman uh, in the text, and he shall rule over you. But this, however, was not creation's intent. Here is what we have concerning rulership. A third aspect is that we usually hear that the woman was created to be the helper of the man. And we commonly perceive this term as denoting a lower or secondary status. The word helper has come to mean something like a maid. Uh, in fact, in English, people will say the help, and they mean the maid. This understanding, however, is anachronistic, and it has nothing to do with the meaning of the Hebrew term ezer, which is used in Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, ezer, as his partner. So the Hebrew term ezer does not signify something inferior. In the book of Psalms, especially the term ezer is often used of God himself, who is the helper of Israel. In Psalm 33, 20, for example, we read our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. So obviously the Lord is not the maid of Israel, nor is he inferior to Israel. In a military context or in circumstances of threat, the word ezer should be translated not as helper, but as ally. The context of Eden now, it's in the light of the threatening presence of the serpent. This should be the most appropriate translation, ally, not helper. As Adam finds himself in the battle, he will need to depend on Eve so that they may prevail together. So without this ally, it will be impossible to face the challenges placed before them. The failure to have a common front, a coalition, will sadly bring about the fall of humanity later on. It doesn't take much thought to see how this is often the reason of failure in our marriages and in our churches as well today. So the matter of the side of Adam in the creation, we often think that the narrative about the creation of the woman from the side of the man demonstrates that God created the woman as inferior. And at this point, however, we need to know that the understanding of the ancients about the sexes was probably different. They seem to have believed that instead of two biologically different sexes, they thought that only one sex exists, the male one. Female is simply a subcategory of the male. According to Thomas Lecure, we can see this clearly in Aristotle, but also in other writers who share the same understanding up until the 18th century, when the theory of the two distinct sexes began to develop. So the Bible does not communicate to the ancient people in ways they would not understand, but it begins with the worldview that dominates their age. It is not the purpose of the Bible to explain scientifically how humanity came into being, 
but to teach how God relates to humans. And this is achieved by means of the ancient images and meanings, regardless of how limited this may have been. Therefore, despite the fact that the female is presented as a byproduct of the male, and this explains the title uh, Isha, which means woman, which is produced from the title Ish, man, in 223, this has nothing to do with the qualitative evaluation of the two sexes, because as we have said, the woman has already been deemed by God as his image, equally worthy with man and as Adam's necessary ally in the battle. So in fact, she's described as corresponding to Adam in 218 with the Hebrew word neged. So the other issue is the naming. Another misunderstanding in the creation story is that the one who names another necessarily exercises authority over that person. This is the way that people often interpret the act of Adam to name not only the animals that God created, but the woman as well. The act of name giving in the Bible, however, has nothing to do with authority, but with the recognition of a particular characteristic or truth relevant to the recipient of the name. Name giving is an act of interpretation rather than authority. When Adam names the animals, he's doing nothing more than identifying the roles and functions of the animals he observes. He acknowledges that God has already created and determined these animals. We see, for example, in the book of Ruth uh, 417, we see all the women of Bethlehem coming together to name Ruth's child, but none of them has any authority over that child. Another example is the Egyptian slave, Hagar, who names God himself, calling him El Roy, Genesis 16:13. So clearly, Hagar does not have authority over God. Therefore, when the man looks at the woman in the garden in a poetic manner, he acknowledges who she is and how she was created. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called Isha, for out of Ish, this one was taken. So the title that he gives her, in no way does it determine her. All it does is to acknowledge God's creature and her correspondence to him with respect to her sex. Similarly, in chapter three, after God had already given the reproductive function to the woman in 316, after that fact, did Adam name her Eve? In 320, a name that is based on the peel stem of the Hebrew root of Haya, which means giving life. This is the same root, by the way, from which God's name uh, is derived, Yahweh. So the text itself clarifies for us the reason for which Adam names the woman Eve, and the reason is not some exercise of power or determination of her identity. The reason is simply a retrospective recognition of God's creative work and what he has determined for her. Because the text says she was the mother of all living. To summarize what we have said so far concerning the creation of the woman, she was created in the image of God, something radical for the status of women in the ancient world. She was given the exact same authority over creation that was given to the man and no divine intention is found in these stories that she should be ruled by another human. She's a helper in the sense of an ally and not in a subsidiary role. She's created from the side of Adam because the ancient world could only think of the existence of a single sex, the male one and the female as derivative. And finally, the woman is named by Adam not as an act of authority over her and determination of her identity, but as an act of recognition of the identity given to her by God. This is Eve, God's masterpiece. And as her name declares, she is the critical agent for the continuation of humanity's life. 
So it is important to keep this element at the forefront of our memory, because as we shall see after the fall, the status of women will be far from God's ideals. So now let's go to examine women in the post-fall world. The post-fall world is a patriarchal world. As we saw, and he shall rule over you, this describes the new situation of the post-fall world. And within this patriarchal world, the Bible often presents a very bleak picture of how women were treated in Israel and in their neighboring nations. So various texts reveal the violence that women were subjected to, the dangerous conditions they would find themselves in, and the injustices they suffered. The story of Dinah's rape, for example, in Genesis 34 reveals significant truths about the status of women. And this horrific story, not only was Dinah raped, but the whole city of Shechem was slaughtered as a result. What is most revealing is the reaction of her brothers who said that Shechem treated their sister like a prostitute. Should our sister be treated like a prostitute? So what does this reveal? This does not mean that Shechem paid Dinah for a sexual visit. It means that he has treated her sexuality as if she had no protectors over that sexuality. In the ancient Near East, the sexuality of women was not a private matter, but a valuable good that was under the supervision and authority of the patriarchal home. Therefore, Dinah's brothers are upset because Shechem treated their sister like a woman who is outside the care of the patriarchal home and is completely abandoned by any male defenders. This is revealing then of how women who found themselves without male defense outside a patriarchal home could easily become prey to all kinds of abuse. The story of Tamar in Genesis 38 confirms the despair in which Tamar found herself once Judah had kicked her out of his patriarchal home since she, become, uh, she became a widow. In order to find herself back into a home and be able to survive, she's forced to resort to measures of seduction like a prostitute in order to secure her rights. In this case, we see sexuality becoming the only available weapon for a woman to survive especially when the law that was created to her favor was neglected. And in this case, the law of levered marriage, uh, which uh, we can read about in Deuteronomy 25, that is the responsibility of relatives to marry their brother's widow, not abandon her. This is the same law that Ruth will attempt to activate, that is bring to the attention of Boaz and urge for its fulfillment. And again, Ruth and Naomi as well find themselves outside a patriarchal home, male defense and care. So Ruth is initially forced to begging in the fields of Boaz and then to following a plan of sexual seduction to secure survival for both herself and her mother-in-law. Uh, in various occasions in the book of Ruth, we have indications on the treatment of women. For example, I have ordered the young men not to bother you, Boaz said to her. The fact that Boaz had to order his men not to bother her, not to reproach her or rebuke her, there's three more times in the book that uh, this thing is mentioned, it reveals the dangers which were obviously so common, especially towards the women and even more immigrant women, that Boaz had to make a special prohibition against such a treatment. Of course, the time of Ruth is the time of the judges. And we all know this book that reveals the horrific status of women. In this book, for example, we have Jephthah uh, in Judges uh, 11. Uh, this is the judge who was more than willing to sacrifice his own daughter 
to secure his victory. Even though we know from various places in the Old Testament that God resents human sacrifice. So we have also in the book of Judges, the Levites concubine in, in Judges 19 and 20. We see in Israel, uh, we see Israel being in a state where even their most holy tribe, that of Levi, was behaving like a criminal. Not only did this Levite hand over his concubine to be gang raped, not only did he not bury her, which was something required by law, even for the, most, for the worst criminals, but he butchered her in pieces as if she was an animal. And this is what King Saul would later do in 1 Samuel 11 to Oxen when he wanted to recruit all the tribes to war. Following this story, we have the capture of 400 virgins of Jabesh Gilead by the Benjaminites after they had slaughtered the rest of the population, the families of these virgins. And we also have the massive kidnapping of the women of Shiloh while they were dancing by the same people, the tribe of Benjamin again. So these are stories that remind us of nothing less than Boko Haram's kidnapping of hundreds of girls in Nigeria. This is how Israel was when they entered Canaan and how, apart from a few exceptions like Boaz, they treated their women. The book of Judges attributes this chaotic state of their society to the fact that the new generation did not know the Lord nor their history. They did evil in the eyes of God and they began to worship other gods. This is in 2, 10 to 15. This brings us to the extremely important distinction we need to make when approaching the Old Testament to understand the status of women. The Old Testament is very often descriptive of the culture of Israel, not prescriptive. And one needs to distinguish when a description is given in a way that condones a cultural norm, critiques it, or has a neutral stance before it. The fact that Hebrew narratives are often laconic, it makes it harder for us to discern the ethical stance of the writer towards the culture he describes. But sometimes he makes it very clear. For example, the prophetic books are often adamant about forms of Israelite life they disapprove of, such as idolatrous worship. And we saw some of the discoveries uh, of idols. And Israel practiced idolatry, but the Old Testament is not identical to Israel. We must, need, we must remember this. By looking at ancient Israel, such as the one portrayed in Judges, we have not understood the position of the Old Testament because the Old Testament is most of the time the product of theological visionaries with a critical stance and a desire to reform this existing culture. So the writers of the Old Testament inherit a fallen world of injustices, inequality, and corrupt patriarchy. And they do not hide this corrupt state of their own culture. They do not attempt to overthrow patriarchy or certain institutions, for example, slavery, but they will critique it. And in the context of law, they will try to regulate it, to keep it in check and even to relativize it at times. So this is the next um, uh, theme we will discuss now, how women are presented in the Mosaic law. So apart from the narratives of the Old Testament, often the existence of certain laws offers us a window into the culture that existed and the kinds of things that were practiced. Something must have been a practice in order for a law to be written against it or attempt to regulate it. But God did not abandon his people to their own devices and especially to the tendency of running society in a selfish, in a greedy and discriminatory way. Instead, after the fall, he has made sure to give regulations in order to limit and educate this fallen nature that we find ourselves in. 
the Apostle Paul, in fact, in Galatians 3, 9, he says that the law was added because of transgressions. We are transgressors now. So the law is needed for us. We must also note another characteristic of biblical law. It is dynamic. What do we, we mean by that? Well, for example, we observe a law given in Exodus 21 2 in the context of the giving of the law at Sinai. And this law states, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. Now, in Deuteronomy 15, 12, however, that's a generation later on the border of the promised land, the law reads as follows. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year, you must let them go free. Now, although we cannot know what motivated the inclusion of women in the regulation in its new context, it suggests that um, something, there was a fluidity uh, in the law. It shows us that there's a fluidity in the law and there was a need for a more explicit focus on the value of women. And now we have another example that is found in the Ten Commandments. And this gives a subtle change again from Exodus to Deuteronomy. For example, in Exodus, we have um, in Exodus 20, 17, the text reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. However, in Deuteronomy, the same law reads as follows. The wife who had previously been included as one of the items in the list of house belongings, she's now differentiated and receives mention on her own. Reads as follows. Neither shall you covet your neighbor's wife. Now the belongings of the household will follow in a separate list. Neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, according to an Old Testament scholar, Daniel Block, he says, the location of your neighbor's wife in the Exodus version opens the door to irresponsible males justifying treating their wives merely as household property. Here, Moses removes the ambiguity and elevates the marital relationship above all other domestic relationships. Now, this is of utmost importance because the law is not static in the sense that when someone uh, may be using the letter of the law to abuse another, in this case, to discriminate against the wife, then alterations or clarifications will be made to the law in order to prevent it from being used for oppression. The law is there to serve God's people, in this case, the daughters of God, and it should be amended when it is being abused to achieve the opposite. This is also seen in how laws that were common in the ancient Near East are altered in the Bible in order to prevent the abuse of women. Let's see an example from Mesopotamia, from the Mesopotamian Hammurabi law code uh, in verses 209 to 210, which scholars have shown that it contains many parallels with Old Testament law. This is the same culture, the same world. So we have the following instructions in the Hammurabi law code. When someone attacks a pregnant woman, if a free man hits a free woman and causes her to miscarry, then he must weigh out 10 shekels of silver for her fetus. If the woman dies, then they can kill his daughter. Now, this law sounds very similar to the law in Exodus 21, uh, which is in the Bible about uh, an attack against a pregnant woman again. But the similarity of these laws is not important here. What is important is that while the law of Hammurabi 
recognizes that the woman was killed and therefore a life must be given according to the so-called talionic principle, which means life for life, we see that the punishment is not incurred by the guilty party, but by his daughter instead. So apparently, daughters in the ancient Near East were given over for punishment for the sins of their fathers. And naturally, it would have been mostly daughters since they were less important than sons who had a greater economic value for the family. In the book of Deuteronomy, however, a stop is given to this practice, thus safeguarding the girls from being used this way. Parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their parents, only for their own crimes may persons be put to death. Now, there are numerous laws we could discuss that have to do with the status of women in the Old Testament. But for our meeting today, I have decided to focus on a single chapter, chapter 22 of Deuteronomy, which has a lot to do with marital laws and rape laws. This is a chapter dealing with women in a way that most commonly concerns readers. Actually, most of the questions I get about women in the Old Testament come from this chapter. So it would be good for all of us to look at it together. So Deuteronomy 22, uh, it involves various cases, this chapter, and we will take case by case together. So case one is the case of slandering a virgin. We don't need to read the entire text, but I will just highlight different points in the story. So case one describes a man who marries a girl and then decides that he does not want her anymore. So the text literally says he hates her, which is a verb used for someone who wants to divorce a woman. From various divorce documents, uh, we know this kind of language. They, these documents were actually discovered in Egypt and the Jewish colony uh, that existed in Elephantine, this beautiful island that we, we find in Upper Egypt. Uh, there was a Jewish colony there and they left us with tons of documents from uh, 6th century BC or 5th century BC, so it's very early, and they show us how things operated, how the Jewish law operated. And we learned from these documents that when a man wanted to divorce his wife, he would pronounce in front of witnesses the words, I hate my wife, usually three times, I hate my wife, I hate my wife. Um, one could not divorce his wife without giving some reason, of course. And according to the divorce law that we have in Deuteronomy 24.1, it is understood that he, he would have to claim some sort of indecency in the woman. In our scenario here, the husband makes up a false allegation. He accuses the wife of not being a virgin at the time of their marriage. Now, in the patriarchal culture of Israel, this was a very strong argument for dissolving a marriage because the Israelite culture was patrilinear. Patrilineage means that descent and inheritance is reckoned in the father's line, not the mother's. So one had to secure that his heirs were his own children. And this is the reason this law deals exclusively with the woman's virginity, not the man's. So, but this should not be taken to mean that it was permissible for a man to be promiscuous before or after marriage. If a man happened to sleep with an unmarried woman, then he was obliged to ask her father for her hand in marriage and pay the mohar. The mohar is with the customary compensation price given by the husband to the father. So this is a serious accusation. Since someone other than her husband could have gotten her pregnant. However, the text stresses the seriousness of this accusation in that the name of the woman is seriously defamed. So while it is a huge problem to, to mess up the patrilineage, 
this is not the primary focus of the law. The primary focus is the name of the woman. The woman is seriously defamed. In two different ways, the author speaks of her defamation. He places on her shameful words, the text says, and gives her a bad name. So this repetition impresses on the audience the enormous damage this accusation could inflict on the woman if it proves to be untrue. So the protection of a bride's name gave rise to the custom of acquiring proof of the bride's virginity on the wedding night. Now let's uh, think a bit about the wedding night. On the day of the wedding, the ceremony basically involved the process of the bride going to the groom's house. The ceremony possibly began with the groom and his companions approaching the house of the bride. And the bride was veiled and adorned with her wedding clothes and jewels. There's numerous texts in the Old Testament that describe weddings. She was escorted to the groom's house by her own friends, dancing and singing with tambourines. And the climax of the ceremony was her entrance into the groom's house, which was followed by festivities that could last up to two weeks. The groom's chamber, where the marriage was consummated was called the chuppah. Now, on the first night of the couple's consummation, the blood-stained linen was kept as proof for the bride's virginity against potential slander by the bride's husband. Now, such is the case envisaged in Deuteronomy 13 to 19, which ends up in court, that is, before the elders of the town now. The blood stained linen would be presented to the elders who would then punish the groom for the girl's slander. He would be punished, that is, he would be whipped and fined. Moreover, she would continue to be considered his wife and he would be denied of any rights of divorce as long as he lives. Again, the reason given is the name of the bride, because he gave a bad name to a virgin of Israel, says verse 19. Now there's a triple punishment here. The man was whipped and thereby degraded because he defamed the girl and her family. He is fined because his accusation would have forced the father to return the mohar. And he is forbidden to divorce her because this was the motive of his slander in the first place. So he's forbidden from getting what he was trying to achieve. We must keep in mind that this law is casuistic. What is a casuistic law? Casuistic laws mean that it's a case. A case is described as an example from which the Israelites are to glean the spirit of, of the law, not the letter of the law. It's just given as an example, this law. So the case is, is given so that people would get an idea of fairness in court. And on the basis of that, they would be able to judge analogous cases. So one could imagine a situation where the bride's hymen does not tear on the first night. And so there's no such evidence available for the court this, however, does not mean that the girl is guilty by default because there are more laws in Israel that come to bear in situations like this. For such a serious charge, positive evidence would have to be provided, especially since the law does not allow for anyone to be charged with a capital offense without a minimum of two witnesses. Now, giving a false witness is also approached with utmost severity in the law. And the punishment for a false witness matches the punishment the intended victim would have received. Moreover, as the rest of the chapter will show, one has to determine whether the girl acted freely or whether another man had forced himself on her. So the law is careful not to blame a woman who is the victim of rape. Now, this case, case one, 
betrays something. It betrays a certain ease, perhaps, with which men may have gotten out of their marriages without any regard for the wife. It is possible that some men would find another woman that they wanted to marry and they wanted to be free from any obligations to the first one. In the book, uh, Wisdom of Ben Sira, we see a vagueness that had developed concerning the grounds on which one could divorce. In uh, Sira 25, 26, it says, if she, your wife, does not go as you direct, separate her from yourself. But this vagueness, it's, it, it, it was dangerous. It showed that if one wanted to divorce his wife, any reason could be given. But the only drawback would be that the husband would have to forfeit the mohar paid to the father of the bride. However, if he was to claim that he was tricked by the family, then he would be entitled to a refund of the full mohar or half of it at least. So in this case, though it appears that this man was not simply uh, seeking a divorce, because his allegation, notice this, if his allegation stood, it would mean the death of his wife and not the divorce of his wife. It makes sense then to assume that the husband knew and even intended this legal penalty on the wife. If that was the case and her death was intended, then according to the law of false witnesses in Deuteronomy 19, he's deserving of death himself. But why does the text allow him to live? The law clearly offers a strong protective measure for the wife in view of her lack of legal standing and social power in comparison to the man. The punishment applied to the husband who would attempt such a thing secures not only the good name of the woman he had attempted to get rid of, but also it secures her welfare for life and consequently the rights of inheritance for her children. So to a contemporary audience, it would sound harsh to hear that this man who had falsely accused his own wife is not only permitted to live, but is required to stay married to her forever how would the wife feel to be stuck with a slanderer who had attempted to get her killed? How is this good news for her? Note that the law does not forbid the woman from asking for a divorce. Only the man is deprived of that freedom. So even though the law in Deuteronomy speaks of the husband as the one writing up a document of divorce to the wife in Deuteronomy 24, it does, not say, it does not explicitly forbid a woman from asking for one. Again, the Jewish colony of Elephantine in Egypt did allow a woman to divorce her husband. Even though the biblical text presents only the husband as the one who can draw up a document of divorce, he did not have absolute rights over divorce, but the elders of the town did. They are the ones who decided if one could divorce, just like they could forbid a divorce, as our case has demonstrated, as well as forbid marriage in certain cases, uh, like 24-4. They could presumably exercise, the elders, they could exercise pressure on a man to draw up a divorce if they found that the wife was suffering. Actually, in Exodus 21, 10 to 11, for example, we have the situation where a woman is deprived of her food, clothing, and marital rights. And in such an occasion, she's entitled to leave her husband. This implies that the elders were involved. They would hear her claim that she's deprived of her rights, and they could enforce her release from such an uncaring spouse. This was also the case in the law code of Hammurabi where the wife could obtain a divorce after a judicial decision would recognize the guilt of the husband. But we should, however, take into consideration 
the situation of women in the ancient world. When we examine these kinds of verdicts, what would have been the situation of a woman who was divorced in the context of ancient Israel? And who would benefit from this predicament? Well, first of all, the law on divorce in Deuteronomy 24 permits it if the husband finds something wrong or indecent with his wife. Therefore, divorced women would be stigmatized since the divorce itself would raise questions about their history or their fertility. So even though they are permitted to remarry, this stigma may have been a major obstacle to finding another husband. Second, women did not customarily receive an inheritance from their father, nor a share of the husband's possessions. So in general, a man's property would go to his nearest male relative or relatives, usually his sons upon his death. So a divorced woman, especially if she had no sons, would have no means of survival unless another man would marry her. Divorced women presumably had access to their mohar. Again, in Jewish elephantine, the mohar was counted among the woman's possessions, even though it was paid to the father. But except for royals and the wealthy people who would perhaps give land as dowry to their daughters, as we see in 1 Kings 9:16. The most common gifts from ordinary households would be jewelry and servants or movable goods that would not provide a woman with enough to support herself for a long period of time. Third, even though evidence shows that schools existed in Israel since around 1200 BC, the fact is that in the ancient Near East, girls would rarely attend school. There were no jobs out there that would offer employment to a woman, a salary for them and housing options for them. So a woman's survival was guaranteed only under the roof of a patriarch, first her father and then her husband. This is more than apparent in the story of Tamar that we have mentioned in Genesis 38, who was forced to devise a very dangerous plan to get her way back into the household of Judah. Therefore, in this kind of context and in this patriarchal culture that existed, the law is not denying the rights of freedom to the woman. On the contrary, the law keeps the man alive and bound to her in order to secure her livelihood. She is not victimized further by being abandoned to a life of destitution on account of her husband. No, he is forced to pay her welfare for life. Now let's go to the second case. Um, case two is a case of adultery during betrothal. This, um, this relates to the previous case because here we have uh, the uh, the occasion where the charge is true, uh, as verse 20 describes, meaning that it was proven not only by the lack of the bloodstained linen, but also by the testimony of at least two witnesses, as Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19 required two witnesses. So and it was also ascertained that the act was not rape, but consensual. This is taken again from other laws then that would mean adultery had taken place, only after all, this, all these laws are covered. The girl had sexual relations with someone while she was betrothed to her husband, and betrothal, of course, after promises had been exchanged, was equivalent to marriage. This does not mean that only the woman involved in this would bear the sentence. Let's not make this uh, misunderstanding. Uh, the scenarios that follow will show how men involved in illicit sex acts are also subject to the death penalty. So let's go to case three. Now, uh, verse 22 speaks of a case where a man sleeps with another man's wife. 
this law is found in many other places in scripture and all over the ancient Near East, in fact. Uh, we, we see it in, in the Decalogue, ex Exodus 20, 14, Deuteronomy 5, 18, Leviticus 18, 20, 20, 10. Uh, and in this case, since the act is consensual and given that it has been proven beyond all reasonable doubt, upon the testimony of at least two witnesses again, then both parties must pay with their lives. And, and let's mention here that the, the death penalty for adultery is not a particularity of Israel, it's in the entirety of the ancient world. Okay, so it's not something uh, unique here. But it was possible for the husband to extend mercy on his wife or the adulterer. We see Judah revoking the death penalty on Tamar in Genesis 38, even though she was betrothed. So in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, we see the husband also free to impose a lesser punishment. And even in Proverbs 635, uh, it seems to suggest that in some cases it was possible for the husband to accept compensation from the adulterer. So it was left to the injured party. Um, but what is at stake here is, why is it so serious? It's again, the paternity of the children. If the wife gets pregnant as a result of this adultery, then the patrilineal lines get blurred, affecting the cohesion of the kinship and the family inheritance. However, this crime was not understood only as threatening patrilineage but it was essentially an attack on the concept of covenant, which was so fundamental for Israel and its existence as a people under Yahweh, their God. The prophets used the image of adultery all the time to describe how Israel betrayed God and worshiped idols, forsaking the covenant relationship they had established with Yahweh. So what was threatened went very deep. It went deep to the roots of basic trust in a society, basic trust that forms the foundation of all relationships among a society's members, much more the most intimate of covenants. So for ancient Israelites, adultery was not a private matter. It was a national matter. It was believed that adultery defiled the land and it brought about the exile of the entire people. So in fact, it was equivalent to national treason. Uh, national treason in, in most countries, even today carries the death penalty. Why? Because one person's act results in the killing of the entire nation. And this is exactly what Israel, how Israel viewed adultery. And they say this, that the, 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 the adultery, the sexual promiscuity and the shedding of innocent blood were one of the main reasons that we are exiled, we lose the nation completely. So this is why they viewed it as so serious, which is very different from how uh, we are used to viewing adultery today. Uh, let's go now to case four. So case four, uh, 23 and 24 verses, uh, this is the next scenario which touches on the topic of promise. Again, another agreement that is based on fundamental trust between two parties. The case involves a man sleeping with a woman who is not yet married to another, but a promise of marriage has been made. So an engagement was taken very seriously in Israel. And this is also apparent in the exception from war that was given to an engaged man because they were very afraid that he might die and not get married, not fulfill his promise. Uh, this is in Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. At the time of the engagement, the mohar was probably discussed with the girl's parents and it was probably paid immediately. So the transaction, let's say, had taken place one could presumably withdraw from the arrangement during the period between the engagement and the marriage, but at a price. So this case is treated in the same way as case three. 
However, note that the situation envisaged takes place in a town. And the town here represents a space where help was available for the woman in the occasion that she was raped. If this was in fact a rape, resistance in the form of a scream would have occurred and it would have been heard. In other words, the fact that a woman did not call for help implies consent in the adultery. Again, the fact that the woman is engaged is the issue here. This is not a sexual act between two unattached people, but the patrilineal lines are once more at stake. Again, we must remember the casuistic nature of these laws. Don't take them to the letter. They're not intended to be followed slavishly. This example is chosen to communicate the spirit of the law. It's a rule of thumb, let's say. The law is warning the Israelites not to condemn a girl that has been raped, but to make sure that this was done in full consent. One could envisage a situation where a man would overpower a girl to rape her in the town, holding her mouth shut or threatening her with a knife not to scream. Surely the spirit of the law would not approve of the condemnation of this girl solely on the basis that she did not scream. The law encourages the judges to reach verdicts on the basis of analogous not identical situations. Let's go to case five now, which where we do have a rape. This is a situation where the sexual act between uh, a man and a betrothed girl did not occur in a town, but out in the countryside. So this is clearly a rape since the text mentions specifically that the man overpowered the girl. So the country here represents circumstances where help is unavailable to the girl or the possibility of resistance and escape does not exist for her. So there's a, an absolute overpowerment. The law then understands that the girl may have called out for help but no one was there to help her. Therefore, she cannot be condemned along with the man who violated her. Uh, now I, I will uh, mention a few thoughts by Martin Luther, the uh, great scholar of the Reformation, uh, who was uh, explaining this verse. And when he was commenting on this verse, he said that the country is just an example. It does not exhaust the law but it refers to any circumstance where a girl finds herself incapable of soliciting help. Just like it would happen if someone were to seize her when she's alone in her house, in her garden, or in her room. If someone were to threaten her with a knife, even if she's not out in the country, at that moment, she finds herself more alone than ever. And here I remember uh, uh, Susanna, uh, the story of Susanna, where she was actually in, the, in her own yard, uh, in her own house. Uh, so she intended to scream the, the woman uh, that Luther is describing here. He's describing a woman who intended to scream, but she couldn't, even if she was in the city. So even though she couldn't, it should nevertheless be understood that she had indeed screamed says Luther. So again, this scenario, as opposed to the previous one, it distinguishes between consensual and non-consensual misconduct. So this is the whole point of the law, the whole spirit of the law, to look for consent. So the authors go on to state that nothing should be done to the girl. And here we must assume that nothing should be done to her reputation either. We already saw how seriously defamation of a daughter of Israel was handled in case one. Therefore, any kind of harmful rumor about her intentions, such as the ones we often hear today about the rape victims being the ones who provoked 
or led on their victimizers or what clothes were they wearing and things like that. It should be understood to be likewise prohibited in the context of the same chapter. Such defamation would be a sort of penalty on her that is completely uncalled for since the girl is innocent of a crime. What is rape like in the eyes of the authors? Do we get the, the weight of rape today? The text says that rape is identical to premeditated murder, 2226. Deuteronomy 19 speaks of cases of premeditated murder. Uh, it speaks of cases where manslaughter happens unintentionally, unintentionally and the manslayer may be granted asylum and escape the death penalty, but it also speaks of a person who intends the murder of another, who waits for him and attacks him fatally, is a predator. The latter involves premeditation for murder and is therefore subject to the death penalty. But in case five, the girl is raped, but the rape is not fatal. She is still alive since the text says that uh, they are not to punish her by death. So she didn't die in the, in the hands of the rapist. However, it seems that the authors consider the effect of the rape as identical to a fatal premeditated killing. They equate the two even though she is still alive. The effects of rape stay with the victim for life. The general principle in the ancient Near East is life for life. But here, even though no life was taken, the authors consider the harm done to be of the same degree. We must also note something else here. Note that there is an absence of witnesses. She's in the country. There's no one. Even if she screamed, no one he heard her. So how does the law of the two witnesses that are required for someone to be put to death, how does it function in this case when there's no witnesses? Well, the only choice for this law to function is for the voice of the woman to be believed. The weight that is given to the voice of the woman, the testimony of the woman in the absence of any witnesses and against the uh, witness of the guilty party she is clearly given more weight. Her voice is clearly given more weight. But the question now arises, will her fiance call off the engagement? Would she be considered damaged goods for him now? Will he be willing to care for her and the potential baby that resulted from the rape? Will he adopt it as his own? Will he honor his promise or abandon his responsibility to this poor soul? Dissolving the engagement would put the girl in a precarious position. She's no longer a virgin and would not be another man's first choice for marriage, especially if she has mothered the child of another man outside wedlock. The text seems to assume that the fiance will honor his promise and marry the girl. And this is where the law of God is count, counting on the just people of Israel, the just males of Israel. Now let's go to case six. Case six uh, is the case of a rape of a girl who is not engaged. So there's no obligation on anyone else to assume the burden of the girl's welfare if the man is executed. In case six, the man is spared and he's forced to marry the girl without ever being allowed to divorce her as well as pay a fine to the father of the girl. So now this to contemporary ears, it sounds like an intolerable situation for the girl who is forced to marry her rapist. But as we have already seen, the situation in ancient Israel lacked the infrastructure of providing an independent life for a woman to pursue a career and sustenance outside household dependencies. The man is no less guilty than the one in the previous scenario. Rape is grievous, but
but the priority of the law is the girl's and her child's survival. The rapist has diminished the girl's chances of getting married and has also diminished the value of the mohar. One would give more for a virgin than for a non-virgin, which means much less to survive on. Therefore, the man, instead of being sentenced to death, he's being sentenced to a lifetime of sustaining the girl and the possible pregnancy that resulted from the rape. The alternative, that is his death, would sound good to modern ears maybe, but would be punishing not only him, but unfortunately the girl as well. Again, let's remember the girl and her family are free to object to this marriage. She's not forced to this marriage. Uh, and this, uh, we have rabbinic interpretations of this law that state that this is the case. She has the, the power to object. The father may decide to provide for the girl himself. He's free to decide that. And he is free to refuse to give his daughter to the man who rapes her. Now, this was just a sample of how the law struggles to navigate through this fallen world where a woman could easily be objectified, abused and abandoned to starvation. And this is the spirit of the law. In other times and places, there will be other ways and means of achieving the protection and the flourishing of women. And we must be careful that an adherence to the letter of the law does not end up achieving the opposite of what it had originally intended. So we must examine these laws and see how their spirit may apply today. We must remember that God gives the spirit not only to the God-inspired scriptures, but he gives the spirit to the readers and interpreters of the church as well, so that the readers can discern the spirit of the law and apply it anew in different ways in order to honor in every age the women, God's own images. Through all of this, we, we must keep returning to God's intentions in his creation. The ones we saw at the beginning for both men and women, intentions that can only be brought about in the kingdom of heaven of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Myrtle. Um, that was an eye-opener, a very beneficial lecture. I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone when I say thank you and uh, that we, we learned a lot from that. Uh, thank you so much and thank you to all our listeners. And uh, just remind you that um, we're trying to have a lecture, an online lecture with someone abroad every month. So uh, stay tuned for that.